Have a headache? Anxiety? A sore throat? There's medicine for that. These days it seems like there's medicine for just about anything. Western medicine has given us so many miraculous things. For example, most of us don't have to worry about dying of polio or infections. People are living longer than ever before. But traditional medicine has a lot of benefits too. And the Native Americans had quite a few medicinal practices that we can still learn from today. Here's what medicine was like for Native Americans. Native Americans did it first. Let's start by playing a little game of who did it first. First up, syringes. According to the Western world, a Scottish physician named Alexander Wood was responsible for giving us these wonderful little needles we all know and love. But in reality, Native Americans came up with the idea way before Wood. A whole bunch of different Native American tribes from the Amazon up to Canada have used hollowed and sharpened bird bones to inject various herbal medicines, draw blood, and treat wounds. They attach these bird bone needles to animal bladders, which they either fill with some medicine to be injected or fill up with blood if they were draining an infected wound or something like that. Not the most pleasant visual, but medicine is messy sometimes. Next up, aspirin, invented by Felix Hoffman, a German chemist working for Bayer. Hoffman was able to take a chemical called salicylic acid and modify it into acetylcholicylic acid or aspirin, which is now the most widely used medication in the world. Cultures around the world have known about salicylic acid for millennia. It can be found in willow trees, birch trees, and a bunch of other plants. There are 4,000-year-old clay tablets in Sumer that describe the medicinal uses of willow leaves. And Native Americans recognize the benefits as well. They would boil willow bark and make teas to help alleviate pain and treat arthritis. Then there's sunscreen. Back in 1801, another German guy named Johann Ritter figured out what UV rays were. It took another 130 years for someone to develop the modern-day white cream that keeps people with less melanin from turning into tomatoes. But different Native American tribes have been using their own versions of copper tone or banana boat for millennia. The Zuni, a Pueblo tribe located in present-day New Mexico, reportedly used extracts from the western wallflower as a natural sunscreen. The Hesquiet First Nations people of the Pacific Northwest Coast used a mixture of western hemlock pitch and deer fat as a sunscreen and skin protected. In the Southwest, where it's a lot sunnier than in the Pacific Northwest, tribes like the Apache and the Navajo use aloe vera, not to prevent sunburns, but to treat them. You can still find aloe vera products at your local pharmacy or grocery store right next to the sunscreen. So yeah, go ahead and get some after your beach day because we all know you're the one to forget the sunscreen at home. Just keeping it real. Finally, the Iroquois used the flowers and rhizomes of yellow sweet clover to treat sunburns and skin conditions. Yellow sweet clover has cooling and soothing properties and can even be used to treat pimples. Alaskan Surgery Up in Alaska, holes were all the rage for many indigenous tribes. How about a hole in your lower lip so big that if you're not careful, your dinner will fall right back onto your plate? Or a hole in your skull to either let the good spirits in or the bad ones out? Surgery for tribes like the Inuit, Aleut, and the Lingit often had a spiritual, ritualistic flavor to it, and they got pretty good at opening people up. Like in Western medicine, the job of a surgeon was held in high esteem. In some tribes, the surgeon was also the shaman, but in a lot of others, they were separate jobs. Surgeons were renowned for their expertise and were often sought after for practical stuff like resetting bones and treating wounds, but they were also responsible for a lot of ritualistic surgeries, like lip piercing. The transmission of surgical knowledge was often a closely guarded process, Skilled surgeons would typically pass down their knowledge to their most beloved or trusted children. One ritual surgery practiced by a lot of Alaskan tribes involved puncturing holes in people's lower lip for things called labrets. Often performed as a kind of coming-of-age ceremony, the surgeon would make an incision in a teen's lower lip, which would gradually be widened until the person had a pretty sizable and painful-looking hole in their chin that would be decorated with some carved wood, bone, or stone. Labrits were used to differentiate different classes of people, but they were also used to help people from different tribes identify each other. On Kodiak Island, the surgeons of the Koniak tribe had a pretty unique way of treating cataracts, which can cause blindness if they continue to grow. The Koniak surgeon would apparently stick a louse, as in hair lice, to a piece of hair and lower it down onto the patient's eye. When the louse dug into the cataract, 
the surgeon would jerk the hair up and down and rip little bits of cataract out, repeating the process until, voila, no more cataract. Then there was the whole drilling in the skull thing. Many cultures across the world have practiced trepanation, and the Native Americans in Alaska were one of them. Trepanation among Alaska Native communities served different purposes, ranging from medical to spiritual and ritualistic. It was performed for things like relieving headaches and treating head injuries. Now, I don't know about you, but I think a hole in your head would be a bit more painful than a concussion. But what do I know? Skill surgeons would make a small hole or groove in a patient's skull using sharp-edged tools made of stone or animal bone that they would then carefully enlarge. The reasons for performing trepanation varied. From a medical perspective, the belief was that creating an opening in the skull would relieve pressure and help with various illnesses. From a spiritual perspective, the hole in the skull was seen as a means to establish a connection with the spiritual realm or to release trapped spirits. Grandfather Peyote The Sioux have a legend that goes like this. Long ago, before the European man, there was a sickness spreading throughout the people. An old woman in one of the villages had a dream that she would find a plant that would save her people. So she took her daughter and went on a vision quest. At the top of the mountain, the old woman and her daughter, cold and hungry, saw a floating man appear in front of them. He told them about peyote and told them where they could find it. Despite not eating or drinking for four days, the mother and daughter sustained themselves on nothing but peyote. The grandmother took it back to her people and they danced and saw life from new perspectives. They commune with nature and learn how to heal themselves. Now, I don't know nothing about living on nothing but a hallucinogenic cactus for four days, but peyote does have a very deep spiritual significance for many tribes, a significance that the U.S. government really doesn't like to acknowledge. Various tribes across the modern-day southwestern United States and Mexico have been using peyote for millennia. They've been a key part of the visions induced in a lot of their vision quests and rituals and have a lot of spiritual significance. Peyote is usually made into a ceremonial tea or eaten whole after the small button-shaped cactus is dried. Peyote itself contains mescaline, which causes visual hallucinations. Colors can appear sharper and more intense. Shapes can morph into... Whoa, man. I think I'm like experiencing a deep physical connection to Earth. Like a total oneness with everything. The Native American church, also known as the peyote religion, emerged in the late 19th century among tribes in the plains region of the United States, particularly the Kiowa, Comanche, and Caddo tribes. The religious movement was influenced by the teachings of a guy named Quanah Parker, a Comanche chief who advocated for the spiritual and healing properties of peyote. Parker basically went from one of the most feared warriors in Native American history to a respected medicine man. Born to a white woman named Cynthia Ann Parker and a Quahati Comanche chief named Peta Nakona, Quana was captured as a young boy and raised within the Nakoni Comanche tribe, where he terrorized the U.S. and Mexican armies as a prolific warrior. You know, later in his life, Quana developed a deep spiritual connection to peyote. He recognized its potential for spiritual growth, healing, and helping preserve his people's traditions and culture. Quana was witnessing in real time the negative impacts of colonization and the erosion of Native American cultural practices. He believed that embracing peyote as a sacrament could help unite and strengthen Native American communities, preserving their spiritual traditions and promoting cultural continuity. As a result, towards the end of the 19th century, the Native American church was founded. It was and is a synthesis of Christianity and traditional Native American beliefs and revolves around the ceremonial use of peyote. But the U.S. government didn't like the fact that they were using a psychedelic substance, despite the fact that it had deep spiritual significance. A decades-long legal battle ensued. Finally, in 1978, the so-called American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed, which created a legal exemption for use of peyote by the church. Problems persisted, though. Another case popped up in 1990, after a Native American named Alfred Smith was fired from his job for using peyote as part of his religious practices with the church. The Oregon courts ruled in favor of his former employer, but it was kicked up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of Smith. The law has been criticized, though, for being too vague. It does a lot more than simply let Native Americans legally hallucinate. It's supposed to protect Native American sacred sites and lands, but cases have popped up again and again over the years where burial sites are plowed over to make way for oil pipelines and the like. Not just for visions. But for a lot of Native American tribes, cacti weren't just for tripping. 
There are tons of cacti species that don't contain kaleidoscopic, vision-inducing psychoactive compounds like mescaline, and Native Americans have been using a lot of these as different medicines and therapies for millennia. There are hundreds and hundreds of different species of cactus that grow throughout the United States and Mexico, and Native Americans have found medicinal uses for a lot of them. Having heart problems? The Shoshone use an unremarkable-looking cactus with the scientific name Pinocerius gregii to treat heart pain and shortness of breath. They call the cactus, appropriately, pain in the heart. In addition to its medicinal use, the cactus occasionally sprouts beautiful flowers. Going bald? Certain tribes in the southwest have used a so-called hedgehog cactus to treat baldness. They mash the stem up and apply it to the offending area. Does it work? It's not certain, but how many bald Native Americans have you seen? In fact, some studies have found that certain Native American tribes are immune to pesky male pattern baldness. The prickly pear cactus, variations of which grow all up and down the western and midwestern U.S., Canada, and Mexico, have been used for all kinds of things. It's used to treat gum and mouth sores, treat warts, help alleviate urinary problems, and can even help treat diabetes. The flowers can be dried and used to treat asthma and digestive problems like coitus. The prickly pear's thorns have been used too. Some tribes use them as a kind of acupuncture, where they're pricked into certain points of the body to stimulate energy flow or address specific ailments. The belief was that by manipulating these points, balance and harmony could be restored to the person's energy system. Okay, I'm writing that one down. The Blackfoot tribe of the Great Plains would use prickly pear in this way. They'd stick the spines into whatever part of the body was giving a person pain and then light them on fire. The spines that burned more actively, that flickered and sputtered the most, were thought to be the most effective. Other tribes used cactus thorns for acupressure, where the thorns were applied to specific pressure points on the body to exert therapeutic pressure and stimulate healing responses. The whole point was to alleviate pain, improve circulation, and promote overall well-being. The First Native American Physician Susan LaFleche Picot was one of the most impressive women in history. Born in 1865, she went from the Omaha Reservation in Nebraska to graduate first in her class from medical school and became the first Native American physician. She was a doctor who could treat tuberculosis, deliver babies, sew up wounds, but she couldn't even vote. The 19th Amendment was passed three years after she passed away. Picot wanted to help the people in her community. Native Americans living on reservations like the one in Omaha where she grew up didn't have access to health care. Picot was on a mission to change that. After she got her medical degree from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1889, she returned to the Omaha reservation and dedicated herself to providing medical care. She started working for a government-run boarding school. But because there were so few other medical facilities in the area, she ended up caring for pretty much everyone. It said that she worked 20-hour days, making house calls in addition to working from a tiny office, all the while making just $500 per year. Picot promoted a hybrid healthcare model that incorporated both Western medicine and traditional Native American healing practices. She was vocal about preventative care and saw how traditional herbs and medicines could be used in tandem with more modern medicine and technology. In a lot of ways, she was ahead of her time. We're seeing a lot more hybrid approaches to medical care these days. She also went on a bit of a crusade against tuberculosis, which was taking out a lot of Native Americans in the early 1900s. She petitioned the Indian Office, which was a government organization that oversaw things like health care and land management on reservations to help out, but they refused. And in addition to lack of health care, there was a pretty good amount of corruption when it came to land management ignoring the land rights of the Omaha people. In 1905, Picot's husband Henry died of tuberculosis. She had a whole drawn-out dispute with the government, which wasn't officially recognizing her and her son's inheritance, which included some money and some land. The Indian office held on to both for two years before finally handing it out to the family. Aware that the Indian office wasn't the most savory of establishments, she went on a campaign on behalf of the Omaha community to expose a group of people, both European and Omaha, who were defrauding people out of their land. In 1910, she traveled to D.C. to speak with politicians about the issue, but they didn't listen, and the problem persisted and more people continued to lose the rights to their ancestral lands. The sad irony about the life and career of Susan LaFleche Picot was that, despite being the first Native American physician who helped so many people in her community feel better, she was sick nearly all of her life. She suffered from chronic back and neck pain. She had trouble breathing. In 1893, she fell from a horse, which made things even worse. She was in and out of hospitals, both as the doctor and the patient. 
1915, at the age of 50, Picot passed away from bone cancer. She was a major pioneer, both as a woman and a Native American. Medicine Wheels Medicine wheels are some of the most mysterious structures in North America. These stone circles that resemble wagon wheels dot the landscape across the Northwest US and Canada. There are about 70 of them that still exist. Some of the most ancient are estimated to be around 5,000 years old. Now, the largest one, called the Bighorn Medicine Wheel in Wyoming, is thought to be around 800 years old, but nobody knows who built it. The Crow, who have traditionally lived in that area, have said that the wheel was there when they arrived, and their legends say that it was built by their ancient ancestors and people without iron. And I get paid extra for doing this. The cool thing about the Bighorn Medicine Wheel and other stone wheels like it is their astronomical alignments. These structures are often positioned in a way that matches up with specific celestial events, such as the rising and setting of the sun, moon, stars, and specific constellations. It's thought that these alignments serve as astronomical markers for tracking seasonal changes, marking important celestial events, and possibly for agricultural and ceremonial purposes. But there's also a reason they're called medicine wheels. While the original purpose of the wheels is unclear, there are theories that the wheels were used as sacred ceremonial spaces where healing rituals and vision quests took place. Some of the wheels are divided into four sections, a sacred number for a lot of Native Americans. You have the four seasons and four cardinal directions, of course. But there are also the four stages of life, birth, youth, adult, death. The four trials, success, defeat, peace, and war. The four celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, the earth, and the stars. Different tribes have attached different meanings to these wheels over the ages, and more modern UH interpretations have popped up in the last few decades as well. Still though, the construction of these stone wheels and their precise origins remain cloaked in mystery. It's likely that multiple tribes and cultures throughout history contributed to their construction. Native American communities have passed down oral traditions and stories connected to the sites, but there's limited archaeological evidence to say for certain what they were originally used for. Black Elk's Vision Black Elk was a Lakota medicine man with a story that kind of encapsulates the shift in the country from Native American traditional medicine to a more Western model. Towards the end of his life, he converted to Catholicism, which had a big impact on his healing practices. He incorporated certain Catholic rituals and symbols into his ceremonies, merging aspects of Christian spirituality like holy water and signs of the cross with Lakota traditions. His story has been immortalized by the book Black Elk Speaks, a series of interviews he did with the poet John Nyhart. In it, he describes a vision that changed his life. When he was just nine, Black Elk was deathly ill. He fell into some kind of coma for a few days. People around him were seeing this child slip away. But Black Elk was seeing visions of rainbows, horses, and the interconnectedness of everything. His vision starts as he leaves his body and follows two guys with flaming spears out of his tent and into the clouds, to the tent of the six grandfathers. Through the tent's rainbow doors, they sit there, surrounded by twelve horses. The grandfathers represent the four directions as well as the earth and sky. Each one gives him a gift and a piece of advice. The first gives him a cup of water with the sky in it which contains the power to make life. He also gives him a bow and arrow, the power to destroy. Black Elk gets a peace pipe, a hoop representing the borders of his nation, and a red stick that turns into the tree of life. He leaves the tent and then makes four ascents. The ascents represent four generations. Each generation becomes increasingly bleak, and by the time he reaches the fourth, the tree of life has died, and his people are starving. He persists, though, and realizes that he must find strength to continue the cycle of life. He's given an unspecified herb of understanding. He needs to make his nation live again. In his interviews for Black Elk Speaks, Black Elk mentions that he is the third ascent. He'd witnessed three generations in his life, with the fourth and most terrible to come. Was he right? Black Elk would go on to become a respected medicine man and Lakota leader. He carried out one of his first healing rituals when he was just 19. In his vision, he also saw what he described as a four-rate blossoming herb that had incredible healing properties. He journeyed out to a canyon and found it. Soon after, a man named Cuts to Pieces came to Black Elk looking for help for his very sick little boy. Black Elk got down to business. He used the sacred herb and some other ceremonial objects including a cup, a pipe, and an eagle bone whistle, all of which represented, in one way or another, the sacred objects from his visions. During the healing ceremony, Black Elk called upon every power he knew. 
He said he connected with the spiritual realm and channeled healing energy into the sick boy. At the same time, he seemed to take on some of the boy's troubles. He also said he experienced deep emotions and grief as he performed the ritual. Through the power of his prayers, songs, and the unnamed sacred herb, Black Elk ended up healing the boy and saw him recover. At just 19, Black Elk had already earned a reputation as a respected healer within the Lakota community. Later on, Black Elk would fight in the Battle of Little Bighorn, and then in 1887, he joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and traveled to England. Western ideas and spirituality were starting to seep in. But not really. When he got back, he was active in the ghost dance movement. Ghost dances were popularized by the Paiute in the late 1800s. They were meant to reunite the living with the dead, a way for people to reconnect with their ancestors. It was also a way to bring these spirits back to life so they could help fight off all the westward expansion by the U.S. and help bring back a time of prosperity for the tribes across the continent. What other medical practices and other time periods or civilizations do you want to know about? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.